This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Kring. We're here today with Molly Gray. Molly is the principal program manager for blockchain at Microsoft. Microsoft, as I'm sure many of you are aware, has been very active in the blockchain space. Uh, they sponsored the Ethereum DEF CON um, last year and maybe this year again. Did you guys sponsor this year again? Yes. Right, twice. And uh, they were one of the first or you know, one of the first big tech companies to really uh, get into the blockchain space. And, and I think uh, Molly was, was a key driver in that. So thanks so much for joining us today. No problem. Thanks for having me. So can you give us a little bit of background? I think you've been at Microsoft for a long time. What, was, what have you been doing there and how did your career kind of evolve to end up uh, where it is today? So yeah, I'm working on my 17th year at Microsoft. Uh, and I started uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, so which is a banking uh, hub in the United States, uh, and came on in the financial services vertical. And I was a trading floor application developer at the time. And I quickly moved to uh, to our uh, a developer and platform evangelism team, which is essentially uh, when .NET first came out, we were um, uh, going around talking to software architects and developers and explaining the intricacies of how .NET worked and you know, why you wanted to use it, why it was better. Uh, spent a lot of time doing that and then um, came back into financial services and ended up getting relocated and taking a job in New York City uh, two, a little over two years ago um, to run the innovation labs there. And uh, that's where I picked up blockchain again, uh, which is the first time I did it. I was, really wasn't aware uh, when I was doing Bitcoin. Nobody really paid too much attention to what was going on under the covers um, too much other than you know, just getting your cryptocurrency uh, working. And, and unfortunately, I lost my, my private keys from very early on. So I have some orphaned Bitcoin out there. Um, but picked it back up uh, in 2015. And, uh, and incubated uh, blockchain at Microsoft in New York and uh, got pulled in to actually build out our uh, strategy. And, and now we have an engineering team here in the product group within Azure, and I'm uh, leading up the design and architecture here for that. So what was it about blockchain that fancied or you know, triggered your interest? Well, being in financial services, there was a you know, there's so much uh, you have to do around um, uh, settlement times and the pain around settlement and the pain enterprise organizations go through uh, when an audit is triggered um, and it's just identifying some of the things that uh, that blockchain could solve and really it was the smart contracts was the hook um, to be able to define. Uh, the data that you're going to share with uh, other people, but also behavior um, and intent. Um, so uh, smart contracts in a large degree really kicked the uh, interest in blockchain into overdrive because people started thinking of it in other ways than just a cryptocurrency. Um, so we started to see that more as a platform for delivering innovation to businesses and and the way we do business uh, and really break apart and simplify a lot of business processes that have evolved, evolved over decades. Um, so that's, that's what, you know, really interested. Uh, first was in financial services, specifically in the derivatives market. Uh, but now it's you know, spawned into uh, just about every industry there is. So Brian mentioned earlier that uh, Microsoft was one of the first companies to, well, one of the first large companies, you know, uh, sort of the historical uh, figure in, in tech to really dive in headfirst into blockchain technology and infrastructure. Uh, can you describe sort of at a high level 
what the strategy is for Microsoft uh, with regards to blockchain and blockchain as a service. Yeah, so we see blockchain as being very almost like creatively destructive uh, to a lot of our, we have a huge enterprise business um, and um, our customers are always coming to us asking for innovation ideas or ways that they can improve uh, their outreach to their customers or their products or their processes. And, um, you know, we saw this as an opportunity. A lot of our customers were, were um, having a lot of um, desire to at least try blockchain, um, which initially was very difficult to do. Uh, and how do they even approach it? So, you know, our initial goal was to say, hey, let's make it easy for people to, to learn what blockchain is um, and to just get started. Uh, and blockchain is a service, when I launched it, um, well, it's been over a year now, um, was it, it, its main goal is just to make it easy for people to stand up a private blockchain network um, and to start tinkering with it and learning it. And, you know, we started out with Ethereum, but quickly uh, customers wanted to try out Eris, which has uh, been renamed. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, multi-chain, uh, now we have a chain and a whole bunch of different blockchains out there. So everybody wanted to try out the different uh, the different blockchains and, and start to test them. And uh, that's that was the initial goal. Um, now we've uh, greatly expanded that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, now, but that was that was our primary goal: is just to meet customer demand, um, uh, to to allow them to do it. And we felt like the cloud was a great place to do things. We called it the fail fast, fail cheap, because we knew nobody was going to build anything right out of the gate that would make it to production, uh, that they would you know, tinker and play and, and try something and fail miserably, but uh, with that low cost. So you just delete it and start all over again. Um, and uh, that's that was our initial design goal. I agree that uh, sort of that fail fast model is, is really valuable. Like today I, I signed up for, uh, for Azure. I, I think I had done it a while back, but I never really gotten through with with it. But uh, I signed up for Azure, like I had a uh, some credits. I spun up an Ethereum network. It took about five minutes. You just basically set it up, and it was really easy to do, right? So if I, I can see that, uh, you know, having set up a a, a a Geth node before on my Mac, um, this was much more pleasurable. <laughs> this was a much more pleasurable yeah. experience uh, as a whole, rather than having to install like npm and node and you know, like all this other stuff uh, and, and that often is really complex and buggy and, you know, takes a long time just to get you off the ground. So I, I think that for a lot of people getting started, I don't know if they're going in that route, but it definitely looks like something really attractive for someone who wants to play around with like multi-chain and, uh, right. uh, you know, wants to, wants to get started really quick. Yeah. So we, actually we were quite surprised when we were researching this to learn that Azure, uh, like the number of, data centers that you have all around the world and how, um, yeah, it seems like a, like a massive cloud infrastructure, which I really was not aware of. Um, can you talk about sort of, uh, but perhaps just describe for those who aren't familiar, what, what is Azure and how, you know, how blockchains fit into the Azure offering? Right. So Azure is, um, our, our cloud platform. Um, and, it is really targeted initially, and it's always been targeted at the enterprise market. And so uh, we started to, uh, and also our own internal systems, so uh, our own you know, Bing and Xbox Live and things like that. Um, so we initially started to, to put data centers out there for initial you know, redundancy, speed of light issues. You know, you want to have things close, uh, geographically dispersed, and started to work with our enterprise customers and the, the, a lot of the major concerns were not technical in nature, but more government um, related. So we needed things in certain jurisdictions for data residency laws. So what we quickly found is we would build these footprints and we could put these massive data centers um, all over the world. But we started to find out, oh, we need to put data centers in specific countries or specific regions. And they also have to have a fault domain within that same region um, so it ended up, we, we, uh, have over a hundred data centers around the world. Uh, we're in, I think 39 different regions, which is lar actually larger than our two lar closest competitors combined. 
Um, and it's really targeted at uh, where we have a, a jurisdictional issue with enough, enough customer demand, we're going to put and service our, our customers there. And the interesting point is all those data centers are linked with our own dark fiber. So we actually, I think we have the second largest dark fiber network outside of you know, a government <laughs> where we live. Uh, so it's a massive um, uh, dark network that you're not, that you can go between data centers without touching a public network. And then we have this other piece. So this is that massive, we call it hyperscale cloud uh, to deliver computing on demand. And when we first launched Azure, um, we actually overshot the market. We launched Azure with a platform as a service message where you didn't concern yourself with spinning up virtual machines. You just said, hey, I need I need a database. Give me a database. Uh, get, I want to stand up this web app. Here's a web app. And you just put your requirements in and behind the scenes, it would make sure that you had the right resources from a hardware and storage and networking perspective. Uh, and then uh, AWS came out with where the market actually was, was they weren't ready for next generation applications. And uh, so they, they came out with uh, infrastructure as a service. So then we quickly followed with that. Uh, but now the market's moving back into platform as a service. You're starting to see a lot of talk about serverless environments where you have this execution environment in the cloud where you can reach out and access capabilities or functions uh, that you need um, without saying, I need it to run you know, on this type of hardware, on this operating system. You don't concern yourself with that. You basically say, this is what I need to do, or this is what I need. I don't care how you get it to me. Uh, just do it within these uh, SLA, and I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, so the Azure is that sort of worldwide network where we're delivering um, data uh, based on uh, and meeting those restraints around data residency, uh, compliance, security. Our, our security and compliance portfolio is the best in the business. So when you start to look at you know putting things in the cloud, you have to have all those. There's a long list of check boxes you have to go through to get enterprise customers ready to start putting data and their biggest processing uh, workloads out there. And, um, and that we're starting to see customers moving, moving in, in mass, uh, certain workloads, and we'll see more and more go through. So net new applications we're starting to see um, being built with the cloud in mind. And lastly, Azure is also uh, hybrid. So you can uh, run something called Azure um, Stack, which is an on-premises private cloud, which looks and feels and behaves just like an Azure. Uh, so it's a, like a, setting up your own data center in your own uh, or Azure cloud in your own data center. And it looks like a region and it can burst out to the cloud for more compute resources or storage and things like that. So it's that hybrid on-prem uh, and uh, public cloud, uh, if you will. Cool, very interesting. And you mentioned before that part of the reason why you guys got into blockchain was that a lot of Microsoft's clients, you know, they wanted to try out blockchain and they were sort of looking to you guys to make that easier. But is there a larger thesis that Microsoft has about, you know, where technology enterprise software is going over the next maybe decade, two decades? that uh, informs how you guys are approaching blockchain and maybe not just right now when it comes to this experimental phase, but also beyond when we're going to go into production and actually, you know, big applications run on blockchain systems. Blockchain itself is uh, forcing sort of a, a business process uh, re-engineering effort uh, across industries. So because we're dealing with the enterprises, these enterprises are, are moving away from uh, business processes operating within their own four walls, which is hard enough as it is getting interoperability in a large organization across applications. But now saying, I want to be able to have that same interoperability between my most fierce competitor uh, and uh, throughout an entire supply chain. How do I do that? And, and before you really didn't have that option because you didn't have a a shared truth like the blockchain to be able to um, you know, share 
uh, that data and have one place to go for reconciliation to see where the process, a business process is that crosses organizational boundaries, which is essentially everything in this global economy. Um, and it touches every, uh, every industry. Um, so with that, we said, okay, we'll kind of backed into the cloud being, uh, and blockchain initial, uh, at a first glance, people said, well, why would you do blockchain in the cloud? And it's, uh, at first it does seem, seem counterintuitive, but uh, if you think of what the cloud is, the cloud is essentially a massive distributed system. Um, because so we're in these massive data centers all over the place. Uh, but you're, uh, you have different levels of distribution, right? You just, dis you distribute things for different reasons. You distribute things for disasters, right? I don't want to have all my data centers, uh, in lower Manhattan. And that happened in nine 11 and, and that was a problem, right? So you need to have uh, redundancy outside of a geographic area. Um, you need to have, uh, you know, data residing in different areas. So there's, you need a lot of that flexibility, but once we started looking at that, we said, okay, Customers are going to start wanting to move to what we call the collaborative economy, where you you work with each other, and it's a part of the business process. So cross-organization uh, distributed workflows is, uh, if we look at supply chain, uh, it's a very complex business process. Lots of uh, infrastructure required. Uh, there's a ton of overhead and friction in the in in any supply chain. Um, whether you're manufacturing a product and getting parts from a thousand different suppliers, um, which are you know, actually cascaded down to smaller suppliers, uh, or you're producing a movie, very similar, uh, you have a supply chain. And how do you, you manage that? And then how do you audit that? And we saw that as a fundamental shift to provide not only that cross-organizational um, workflow, and uh, shared data and shared execution and trust, sort of distributed trust. Um, but then it, it sort of changes everything on the back end too, because now you have visibility into uh, your business processes and where there are inefficiencies. Uh, you can catch fraud a lot easier. Um, you can um, optimize a lot better. Um, so, you know, our customer's initial stance is, Hey, we're rethinking the way we're actually doing this business process that we haven't revisited in 20 years uh, with this technology. So we think it's a fundamental shift, and we're really ramping our platforms to work in this you know, distributed. Uh, not it's not just data distribution. So people think too much about distributed compute, distributed data, but really it's distributed trust and um, and moving, uh, looking at your your business processes and, and distributing them, but having visibility of, uh, of where they are at any given time uh, very seamlessly. I think that's a great way of, of explaining, right? Essentially the underlying thesis that that is in, in a, a big part of the blockchain space, you know, that was sort of the thesis or that is a thesis at Eris Monax, but all kinds of companies in this space, right? Like uh, the whole uh, Ethereum for business or even the public Ethereum is also about exactly that process automation stuff. But if, if we agree that this is the big, the big trend that is going to happen, I would be really curious about your perspective. Why are the other big tech companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, maybe Facebook, are they doing something, but they just don't talk about it? Or do they have a different thesis that means they they don't see it the same way and they don't feel like they, they have to take action and move in this direction? What do you think? Well, I think it has more to do with the, the DNA of the organization. If you look at the two big technical companies that are doing a lot in blockchain, it's, it's Microsoft and IBM. And we're firmly rooted in the enterprise. Um, even though blockchain evolved out of a cryptocurrency, so you have this sort of why did it quickly jump over to, to enterprise? It's because it solved a, a problem in a very unique way and stood the test of time, even though people shot holes in it. And then the enterprises quickly said, wow, this is going to change. This could change how we do business completely. Some of them, when they fully understood it, you know, depending on the business, they either had a near-death experience, meaning they're, <laughs> that they're a middleman and they don't provide much 
value other than friction into an existing business process that could be completely disintermediated, or they saw opportunity. Uh, and usually companies see both, yeah, opportunity to reinvent themselves. So a lot of companies we talk to in the enterprise, they see this as a catalyst. It's not pure technology. It doesn't solve every problem, but it provides that catalyst opportunity to revisit. Because Microsoft and IBM are so focused on delivering value in the enterprise and working with businesses on different ways, right? So IBM really has a massive human services uh, business where we're really focused on the software. Uh, we're not trying to sell consulting services. We we rely on our partners to do that. But that's that's why you saw us doing that. I think the reason you're not seeing uh, AWS and Google is they don't have that enterprise focus. Um, Amazon will probably, I mean, I, I can't really speak for where they are and, and what they're doing, um, but I think that's why you see sort of this, uh, while we got out front, uh, will they catch up? You know, I'm sure they will once um, you get into their, uh, get into that, but the actual customer demand, um, we're getting it from these enterprise customers and that's why we went first. I'd like to say it was, we're so visionary, but it's really a little bit yeah. more simple than that. And do you think that's going to remain like that in the near medium term future that the most activity and interest is uh, on the enterprise side as opposed to the consumer facing side? I think it will. I think the evolution of the two will come. Uh, I think what we're going to go through is the enterprises will spin up distributed ledgers and there'll probably be a bunch of them. The public ledgers will provide an interesting backbone and in that we'll start to see interoperability uh, happening using the public network as a bridging mechanism for assets you know, traversing between blockchains, for example, or even smart contracts to uh, bind themselves together, even though they have no awareness of the other network. Um, so the, the public networks become very interesting sort of utility, uh, common infrastructure, and then these consortium enterprise blockchains you know, tapping into those, I think is a very interesting uh, way to see this evolve and eventually get to the point where we flatten these things out and we have this ledger that even though it's not one ledger, uh, we don't have this one massive worldwide database that has an identity for everything and tracks every business process, but we have a way to navigate a hierarchy or, a, uh, or you know, a uh, a mesh of these these blockchains um, or distributed ledgers as they evolve. So I think we will see for the next couple of years, just from a effort and where people will be making a lot of bets and 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 being employed and and looking at solving hard problems. I think it's going to be an enterprise first. I think you know everybody's still sort of waiting on that consumer facing, you know, Uber or. Uh, Airbnb scenario, but you know, if you look at those things, uh, I think it might be those things will pop up once you get industry specific blockchains, and then those will be ones that cross those industry blockchains to solve a unique problem that involves financial services, healthcare, and IoT, for example. Um, that would be a killer app. It's really the composite of this. So we're just building basic plumbing now and within single industries. And once you start going cross industry, that's where you see, um, uh, we'll start to see these really killer apps that, that come out, I think. Now, b before we go into a uh, Bletchley and a little bit more detail, what Microsoft's, uh, you know, blockchain efforts going to look like. I wanted to bring up a concern that I think a lot of uh, people have, uh, and, and I, I saw that mentioned somewhere, maybe it was a comment in front one of your talks as well. So it, one of the central premise of blockchain is this idea of, of decentralization, decentralized control, decentralized processing. How do you, how does that play with um, something like Azure, which is a, you know, a centralized infrastructure provider that really also uh, lives on economies of scale. Do you think, uh, you know, what's the role here in terms of in, in, while the technology is being developed and how do you think that's going to change when some of this technology and, and these blockchains are going to go into production? 
so when we talk about blockchains in Azure, we we say you don't. Most customers aren't going to run their entire blockchain in Azure, unless you're just doing dev and test, right? When you're going into production, very few enterprises, even though they love us and they, they want to use Azure, from a risk standpoint, they want to spread their risk. So they'll say, well, we need to have multiple uh, multiple providers of this network. So you would put you know, a certain number of nodes in, in Azure. You could put a certain number in AWS. You have certain in your data centers. Um, so when we look at the blockchain layer itself, because the the consensus algorithms and the, the database gets uh, propagated and validated between nodes, regardless of where they live, um, that's the model that you know, we would love people to have all their nodes in, in blockchain, but that's not the reality. Um, and so we don't have any dependency. Um, you can actually use Bletchley without having a single node in Azure <laughs> um, and and just call up to those uh, services um, from wherever you are because it's you know, just something out there in the cloud. Um, so when we say, we look at Azure as being uh, the distributed sort of fabric for that um, uh, sort of distributed execution model and not necessarily the uh, place where the, the ledger uh, exists, uh, even though, you know, Azure is a distributed system. I mean, it's all around the world, but uh, like, like I said, there's different levels of distribution. Um, in, that, in that case, you might have a, uh, you know, uh, enterprises need to you know, make sure that they spread their, their nodes across multiple providers, um, and and it's really against multiple counterparties because you might have uh, certain counterparties um, in a financial services blockchain that aren't Azure customers, for example, and, you don't, and IBM. But those nodes will still work on the same network. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at the central. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies. It was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So moving on to Bletchley, uh, there was a white paper that uh, you authored, uh, which is available on GitHub. We'll put the links in the show notes, uh, which is called the Bletchley white paper. And in this white paper, you discuss sort of the evolution from blockchain 1.0 to one, blockchain 2.0. So blockchain 1.0 being the sort of UTXO uh, Bitcoin style blockchain. And then moving on from that, uh, we saw um, the technology evolve into uh, smart contract languages with Ethereum, and now uh, into a new era, which is what you're calling blockchain 3.0. Could you talk about the evolution between these different uh, versions uh, of uh, blockchain technologies? Sure. Yeah. So UTXO you know, was a was built to, for a specific use case. So it was built specifically for cryptocurrency, which is essentially Providencing a, a cryptocurrency, transferring ownership, and being able to make change. <laughs> so, um, and it was built, and it does that very well. Um, and it's uh, we like to think of UTXO if it's if your if your applications are only dealing with bare instruments. So you're proving ownership, uh, proving lineage, and transferring um, of assets. Um, then that model works very very well. Um, and but it, it's somewhat restricted because uh, an individual Bitcoin doesn't have a, an ID. It's just a sum of UTXOs. Um, and when you spend a Bitcoin, it it's you know it's no longer the same. It's just spread out as other UTXOs. Well, when Ethereum came out, 
and they introduced smart contracts, it, it introduced some, some key innovations. The, the first of which was it had an identity. So a smart contract is essentially an account that persists. So I can have an address and assign an identity to something. So I know it's going to be there. And I can also define schema, whereas on UTXA systems, you're essentially, I mean, it, you can have properties in your transaction and an asset, but it doesn't have a, a strongly typed schema, uh, which we've, we found very interesting to be able to define uh, define schema. And then it can have behavior. And and the behavior piece was the, the smart contracts piece, but I'd argue that it's actually those three things together, the identity, the ability to have schema, and then uh, having code or uh, logic there. And uh, that was super interesting in that um, you could start to write these programs and do interesting things. Uh, as an enterprise developer that, that grew up in that, well, I, I went from uh, writing client server applications to having to write three-tiered applications and learn some painful lessons about how we manage state and scale and uh, separation of concerns uh, to make sure that you can version things independently. And we learned a lot of painful lessons in the, the 90s and the early 2000s about how to build applica web applications that could uh, to, that could scale uh, and, 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 and serve uh, the internet. So when we looked at smart contracts today, this is a great way of, of really doing other things on a blockchain. However, I don't think it's going to scale um, to you know massive, uh, even private blockchains that have you know, millions and millions and millions of smart contracts running on the network at once. Um, so immediately just went and said, okay, let's decompose what a smart contract actually is. And if we look at that, it's, um, you know, you have, you define your schema, which includes the properties that you're tracking. And those could be, we, the, the, the example we always give is with a loan. So if you take out a loan, uh, maybe it's a mortgage. You'll have a uh, amount you're borrowing. So that's how much you're borrowing. You have an interest rate, you have a term, um, and you'll have a, uh, and that interest rate could be variable, right? So it, you could get a fixed length one, and then if that's the case, then it's, you know, it doesn't change, uh, but a, a, you could have a variable uh, interest rate. Um, and then you have some rules about, you know, when, uh, what's your payment? When's it due? Uh, what, uh, what's the penalty if you pay it late? And then what's the big penalty if you really go late, you know, about foreclosure? And those are basically legal clauses. And at the end of it, um, if you've ever taken out a mortgage, you get an amortization schedule, which is essentially... Uh, predicting your future states. If you make every payment, this is how much principal is going to be over a 30-year period if it's a 30-year loan. Um, now, if it's a float, uh, fixed, uh, floating interest rate, that amortization schedule can vary based on uh, you know, uh, how your interest rate can go up or down and, and things like that. But that's essentially a contract. And we said, okay, what portions of that uh, need to be, uh, if I was going to, take this smart contract and say, I don't want all of this stuff to be bundled into this one piece of, um, of code data, all intermingled on a node. And when I have a thousand node network, that smart contract runs a thousand times um, to do uh, the same thing when I don't necessarily need that kind of behavior. I want to be able to take out portions of it. So we said, okay, what if you could say, keep the schema keep some logic that just validates your data. So like store procedures, like type of behaviors for relational databases where you're not putting business logic, but you're just validating inputs before you commit to the database. So we could validate signatures and things like that. And then record the, the basic static properties, um, like the amount you're borrowing, uh, the, the signatures of, of the lender and the borrower, oh, those are important to, to capture. But then the, the clauses themselves, the, the payment, the rate that may, might need to be re, uh, recalculated, um, uh, and then the conditions, if, is it late or not, and then how does that, that payment apply? That logic can be pulled out and executed somewhere else as long as we can execute it um, and then attest that it actually does what it's supposed to do. Um, and... Uh, and we can guarantee that it will run. So that's we said. Okay, let's let's talk. Think a different 
differently about defining what a smart contract is. In a sense, it's taking what UTXO-based systems always did, right? They didn't have a smart contract to define schema. They always built these uh, applications on top that had all the business logic, uh, but they were schemeless on the bottom, and it's hard to share that stuff across without using op codes and things like that. Whereas this is a little cleaner, and it it and it feels like it is built sort of for enterprises for me to have strongly typed schema, some uh, logic that can execute in the smart contract to validate my transactions, uh, but then raise up uh, any logic that doesn't necessarily have to uh, be on the blockchain and can be uh, had run in a shared environment uh, by all the counterparties um, and get better performance and scale and all that good stuff. Okay, so I, I think you've sort of started to explain it with your with your answer what we'll get to uh, in a bit, which is which is Bletchley. But if I could just uh, rephrase that in, in in the way that I that I conceptualize it, is that uh, with with this idea of blockchain three point that um, that Bletchley introduces, what you're essentially doing is rather than having all of your smart contract logic, state, storage, uh, and the distributed network within one system, uh, which is essentially what, it, what Ethereum does, uh, you, you, you decompose those components. So you, you decompose the business logic, you decompose, uh, you take out storage, and, and you take out state, and you take out all those components, you, you split them up. And then once you, you, once you have that... Um, base architecture, right, where all of those components can be sort of modularized. I mean, sort of like application development today where, yeah. uh, you know, you have your database over here, you may have cloud storage over here, you may have some other component over here and they all interact together, but you're building this sort of modularized system. Uh, but then the other component that this introduces is this idea that uh, Rather than trusting all of this to a distributed network where it's completely trustless, uh, you can sort of pick and choose, you know, with every component. What where's the where's the cursor, right? So if you want your storage to be fully distributed, that you can rely on this, on a fully distributed blockchain type, uh, you know, public network to do that. Uh, but you know, perhaps some of those functions feeding into smart con those smart contracts don't need to be fully distributed. You can trust some sort of trusted source to execute that logic and provide results. And that's okay. And the people, you know, the, the participants in that network agree on that and uh, like some interest rate, for instance. Uh, is that sort of a good representation of what Bletchley yes. is trying to do? Yes. Today's magic word is Bletchley. B-L-E-T-C-H-L-E-Y. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of a listener reward. So then let's let's talk about the architecture. Uh, describe the Bletchley architecture for us, if you may. Sure. So uh, at the bottom, uh, when you're, you provision one or more blockchains, um, and uh, so you can use Ethereum, you could use Chain, you could use Corda, you could use you know, whatever. You can actually use multiple ones. So uh, above that is this thing called the, the Cripplet Fabric, which is actually right now running in what we call Azure Service Fabric, which is uh, essentially a, a cloud runtime that abstracts behind it. Could be X number of Linux VMs and X number of Windows VMs, depending on you know, what you're using. Um, and they're they're sort of abstracted from you. It spins up more and more resources as you as you go along, and it manages the instantiation, lifecycle, and fault tolerance of components that are running in it. So this is that serverless environment uh, that provides the runtime, which we call the Cripplet Fabric. Um, um, the Cripplet Fabric itself it is that runtime of uh, you register blockchains with it, um, you build. Um, uh, cripplets uh, to run on top of it. And cripplets are uh, these discrete uh, levels of functionality. There's different types. We have utility cripplets, which are usually thought of as Oracle type cripplets or uh, Oracle cripplets. Um, we have contract cripplets, which are taking that logic for a specific smart contract and executing that. 
Um, and then within uh, contract cripplets, there's different types of contract cripplets as well. But those, those are the two basic types. And uh, you have the option of running these cripplets in an enclave. So they can run in a secure, isolated, uh, tamper-proof uh, environment uh, that attests to the results so that they've they they run they ran and did what they say they they did uh, without you having to put the code on the blockchain, but rather just the attestation of the signature uh, for guarantees that your logic ran um, as intended. So, and then above that, um, so uh, the Cripplet Fabric exposes a um, sort of an event-driven uh, API to blockchains underneath it, so you can subscribe if you have a smart contract. You can subscribe to an event, um, so like a, a, a market price every you know, X minutes. Uh, you can set so time-based. You could set it as a threshold. So let me know if oil goes above forty dollars a barrel or below, and and, and when it does, you know, give me this price in this index, and then I'm going to do something on my smart contract. Or you could do it based on uh, so that's threshold. You could do it. Um, uh, the other way around, you could also have um, them subscribe to events just like your CRM system. So maybe your CRM system feeds into a KYC service that you're using. And an event that might happen in CRM, you want to flow in to your KYC system to update your, um, uh, your know your customer system uh, that you have there. So there's a whole bunch of, uh, that exposes a, a surface level API as well. Um, above cripplets, where you can expose a cripplets functionality to a front end or another system, you can invoke a cripplet from the top and have that transaction uh, flow to the bottom. The other uh, key piece that uh, the, the cripplet fabric does is it abstracts the underlying distributed ledger from the cripplet. So the cripplet has no notion or no real idea. It has no dependency on a specific blockchain. Um, it's just running trusted executed code and sending out signed JSON payloads, um, which then get additionally signed by an enclave if, if necessary. Um, the Cripplet Fabric then, uh, as it routes, it has bindings that will format messages for Ethereum, uh, Chain, Corda, and the like. So it provides that abstraction for developers to not have to, especially if you're writing reusable components, which is interesting, you can write these things as a cripplet and have it work across all blockchains and not have to write one for each blockchain, which makes it simpler. Maybe an example for this. I, I, I remember once uh, I talked to, we talked with a bank and, and they mentioned the issue of an interest rate swap, right? And, and the thing there is that there are some calculations that you want to be done, but you know, calculations putting on a blockchain doesn't work very well. Uh, because they're just uh, the perform performance isn't nearly good enough. So is, that would be a good case, for example, for a cripplet, right? So you would define that function, you get executed on a cripplet, and you can you can verify, uh, you know, as participants on a blockchain, you can see what was run in that cripplet. You can see what data was used as input, what was the output. So you know, I could I could potentially run it myself, check it. Uh, so you have you know you have lots of performance uh, benefits. And potentially, as you mentioned, right, you could you could have that cripplet as its own sort of standalone, almost like application, providing kind of an API. So if if we use different types of blockchain, you could always plug into that same thing. Is is that that's kind of the uh, what cripplets make possible, right? Yeah, and and you could also keep that algorithm secret. So yeah, you run it faster, and you might have a an IP in that algorithm that you don't want to share. Um, so yeah, it, it it allows that as well. So if if you kept the algorithm secret though, then you know I would be able to see the input, the output, but I wouldn't be able to replicate. You know, if if I was some other participant on the chain, um, I wouldn't be able to to replicate that, right? Right, unless you subscribe to that same service. So, from a yeah, and as far as the the writing of the blockchain, you're just writing a value down. Um, and you can, depending on the level of trust that you have, so some counterparties entering into those things, that's perfectly fine with them. They they trust that algorithm. You know, maybe it's coming from a third party, so it com comes from a Reuters, for example. 
Um, and they say, yeah, we're just going to use that. And we, we, we trust it. And it's going to sign uh, with the signature. And that signature is actually based off the hash of the code that we all reviewed. Um, so we can attest that, yeah, it ran the code that we all reviewed. Uh, and that's the output. Uh, so we trust it. But it, you know, maybe it runs in a co-located space for optimal performance and things like that. So the Ripple guys once did this project, which was uh, shut down, called Codius. Uh, it, it sounds very similar to to Cripplets. Is is it some of the same ideas, or how how did they differentiate? Yeah, Codius heavily influenced the the first approach. Well, actually, the the second approach. The first approach was for contract Cripplets. So how do we how do we pull logic out of the smart contract while keeping all the goodness of smart contracts in the blockchain? Codius was, how do you do secure attested oracles? Um, and so when we looked at Codius, I talked to the guys at Ripple and, and it wasn't, it was abandoned because it, it didn't have the ability to scale this, right? They weren't a massive worldwide cloud provider to, to stand up this infrastructure. Um, and you know, said, "Hey, we are. I think we could probably deliver something like this. Um, it's not. We don't have the hardware yet, but it's coming. And let's go ahead and build the infrastructure such that there's a lot of people that have value to inject in these systems, and give them a platform for exposing Oracle type behaviors in a cripplet that then enterprises are comfortable consuming. Because you could have the best Oracle in the world, but if the enterprise doesn't trust you, they're not going to use it. So how do we?" How do we empower the 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 smaller innovators and the software partners that we have, and marry them up to these large enterprises that that want their capabilities but don't know how to? We can't have that marketplace to bring them together. So this this idea of a cripplet, I mean, it, it is some sort of an oracle, right? It, to to a smart contract anyway. The smart contract sees it as a as a source of data uh, that the participants need to trust. Um, and before the show, we were talking about how that works. Can you explain for those who are saying, I mean, I can hear the Reddit comments and Twitter comments already, uh, where people are saying, you know, this is just, you know, non-trusted data being fed into a smart contract. This is ridiculous. Uh, can you explain how a, a cripplet can provide a trusted source of executed data? So if, if, if you take a cripplet that would, uh, execute some function, like calculate some sort of a, maybe we can get into some use cases, but, right. uh, you know, a cryptlet that calculates uh, some sort of a, some sort of a, a, a rate, uh, which would go into, you know, the, a, a loan contract. How can the participants trust that cryptlet? Like what is the software and hardware configuration that enables them to trust it? If I'm a smart contract developer and I'm going to use, um, uh, Oracle cryptlet or a utility cryptlet, um, meaning it's going to provide me some result. Um, it could be just a raw market price, or it could be a computed value that um, that I just need to have for my smart contract. Well, when I do that, I essentially make a reference um, to that smart contract that I can find. I mean, to that cryptlet that I find in the uh, each fabric has a a cryptlet explorer where you can discover cryptlets, what they do, uh, and you could subscribe to them. Uh, the subscription process is essentially creating a binding between your smart contract uh, and the cryptlet. Uh, the, the requirements that you have when you're binding in that way is you have to have a callback function because it's an event. So it's a pub-sub model. So the smart contract is subscribing to that, and it wires up the you know, trust that says it's only going to accept messages from this cryptlet address. Um, so the cryptlet signs, it has an identity, and it signs its its messages with that signature so you can trust it. That's just one level of trust. Um, the, the cryptlet can also be run in an enclave, like I said. It could be, if you want that level, now not, not every cryptlet needs that. For most utility cryptlets, unless it's doing encryption, it's probably not worth doing it um, because you really don't have any secrets there. You're just sort of, unless your algorithm's secret, then you want to run it in an enclave, you can. Um, but essentially, the that you you subscribe to it. And you say these are my um, this is what I want you to let me know. Let me know uh, if the markets were open that day and it's four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I want to know at nine a.m. Eastern Standard Time and four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I want you to give me the LIBOR rate and the price of this commodity 
or this list of commodities. And so the cripple will say, okay, I'll let you know. And the cripple goes out and runs. It runs in the fabric. The fabric makes sure that that cripple is running, that it, there's always an instance of it that will fire your event. Um, it will, if something goes wrong, it'll fire up another instance so that you're, you're guaranteed to get that event. It will evaluate the conditions of the event you subscribe to. And if it's true, it will get those values. It will sign its payload. Um, if it's running, in a, it will send that message uh, back through the uh, back through the cripplet fabric, which will um, um, send it into the blockchain. In that case, it's um, sending it. You only have to send it successfully, uh, item potently, if you will, to a single node uh, that will go to that smart contract, um, and then that uh, will get executed and uh, sent around the rest of the the, the network. That's the simplest mode. That's um, the Oracle contract. Um, previously, people would do Oracles, and they would, you know, inject Oracles to a, a separate smart contract, and then your smart contract would watch that other smart contract, and you would look at local events on the blockchain. This is more saying, okay, I'm delegating that uh, pub sub model where the events can f happen out in the real world and be injected directly to me, so that. Um, I don't have this other smart contract uh, out there and this intermediary uh, that's uh, there. You could still do that. There's no, nothing stopping someone from doing a, a queuing mechanism like that for a smart contract and a cripplet as well. But you can do that straight binding between uh, a smart contract address, a callback function, and the cripplet uh, for an Oracle cripplet. So that's that's the sort of the, uh, the that easy the easy case, the the contract cripplet is, or a control cripplet is the pattern we call, is where you're taking that logic out. You're not just getting, uh, in the previous example, you're just getting a, a market data price or some calculation performed, and then you're actually executing other logic on your smart contract uh, and you know, persisting that. If we don't need that to happen, if we could actually do all of that logic and just write the results back, we can then upshift and move all that smart contract code up into a cripplet. Um, and the cripplet can then uh, have a subscription to the market data cripplet that's maybe firing that event. Uh, so cripplets can talk to each other. Um, so I can subscribe to other cripplets events that might be providing Oracle capabilities. So it would give me its signed payload. Um, and then I would execute my logic for my specific smart contract in that cripplet and then write the results out. Now, contract cripplets are mostly, usually going to be running an enclave. So the enclave will attest uh, that it ran in the enclave uh, unmodified and the results are, are guaranteed and write that back down to the blockchain. So in the blockchain, you'll have uh, the results of the, the computation of the smart contract, and then you'll have the signatures of the cripplet and the enclave. Uh, so you'll be able to have that you know, full trust audit uh, capability between the counterparties, um, which is uh, how a contract cripple will work. Okay, so it it really all comes down to the level of trust that you have in 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 this cripplet. I mean, I I think that for uh, for a lot of enterprises, this will make sense because you know they're we're, we're operating in a system that where there are rules and regulation. And enterprise tend to uh, trust each other when they are operating within the sort of blanket of uh, regulation. And it, it seems to me like you, you can then, based on your needs, on the specific use case uh, that you're building, you can set that cursor for trust, right? So if, yep. if you need specific application logic to be distributed and because we need to be operating in sort of a trustless way, you know, amongst each other, uh, and you know, you know, these specific functions need to operate on a blockchain because that's the only way that we can achieve this trustlessness. Then that will that will suffice our needs. Yep. However, for other functions um, or other pieces of data, rather than relying on say like a prediction market to re retrieve the data, uh, we're going to rely on a cripplet. Operating on uh, operating on an enclave, uh, where we have the audit trail for provisioning of the keys, provisioning of the 
business logic and functions themselves. We can trace that. We know it's happening on an enclave. So there's a high, you know, there's a high likelihood, there's a low likelihood that that will get hacked or, you know, there's the, uh, exploited. Uh, and then, so therefore we have a high level of trust in those results because we're operating in this uh, formalized, regulated uh, ecosystem or framework. Uh, and uh, where, where do you think this will go then? Because it's, it's, it's quite a ways away from you know, intellectually from you know ethereum you know or yeah blockchain technology is sort of a distributed everything distributed you know the application stack uh, with uh, ethereum ipfs uh, big chain db you know we're tr- we're we're completely trustless uh that, that's quite a ways away from that um but it seems like it's enabled by technologies that perhaps aren't fully available yet like that are not really commoditized, uh, such as enclaves. Um, wh- where do you see that going? Like, where do you see this going in the next ten years, uh, with res- with regards to how uh, sort of blockchains and these centralized technologies, but highly trusted technologies, how will they interact together? Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good point. I mean, that's a, a design choice and. And what we're trying to do is inject that design choice in there. So if you are in a completely trustless environment, you know, the smart having your logic in the smart contract is the the most appropriate way for you to uh, to do that. But in these semi-trusted environments, which these consortium blockchains are, um, this gives you that design. Uh, as a software developer and architect, you go and say, "Well, where's the right place for me to do this based on the requirements?" Um, and and sort of move it based on that trust pendulum, uh, but also on the privacy pendulum. So again, if you have algorithms that are that need to be private, uh, if I have um, uh, sp- very complex counterparty, multi-counterparty uh, contracts where each counterparty has to maintain secrets while validating the state uh, and participating in transactions, the Cripplets provides a great framework for doing that. Um, so I think what we'll see is uh, as we start to roll out uh, the Cripplet fabric and you'll be able to spin up enclaves on demand. So as a developer, you really don't have to think about, I don't know how to write an enclave for this chip architecture. It's simply a, a property that you check. So is it enclaved or not? Um, and your Cripplet, uh, it's actually uh, getting all of its services from a wrapper anyway. Um, so you get that and it's sort of commoditized and easy to do. Uh, now, as we ro- start to roll that out, um, we wouldn't want you to put everything in an enclave if, if it's not required, because it is a more expensive. Uh, it will be a more expensive because it's an option. Uh, so you want to do it you know, kind of selectively. Um, but uh, it's a it's a good tool uh, for doing that. I think as it, it rolls out and becomes more and more commodities, we'll start to see enclaving being used not only on uh, in the cloud, but on uh, desktops and on mobile devices as well. Uh, so we already have enclaving on phones a good bit. Um, we have it uh, on most uh, uh, Intel desktop PCs that are generation six um, have uh, enclaving capabilities, whether or not the bias supports it or not. So we'll start to move this, this type of secure execution uh, will become more and more prevalent. The, the differences in the, in the cloud is, is it's on demand um, at hyperscale, um, and you only pay for what you use. So you don't have to go out and buy all these this hardware and stuff. So I think it's going to be um, help the the evolution of of applications, and we'll start to see more more capabilities uh, come together. But you still sort of need that that we get the best of both worlds. So you, as a, a developer in public Ethereum, uh, you can then start developing enterprise applications but still use a lot of the same tools. Uh, you, you approach things with a very similar mindset. Um, the, the difference is, as you start to say, you know, my, co- my logic is distributed different than my data uh, in my state. Um, and it's done at different trust levels, uh, whether it's completely trustless or semi-trusted to uh, very discretionary trust in the execution layer. Cool. Well, one of the main 
ways of monetization, as far as I understand with, with Azure is simply that, you know, I, I'm, I'm putting my application on Azure. I'm using up some computational resources and I'm kind of paying by the computational step. Now I can certainly see how that will continue to be a role, right? That you say, okay, we make Azure the best platform for blockchain applications. And that way we're going to get more usage. But are there also some novel, different business models that you guys see emerging with blockchain on Azure? Yeah, I mean, so for Bletchley, we would spend a lot of time talking about cripplets, but there's also uh, some core cripplet libraries that will be shipping. And these will be, this is functionality that we're exposing in Bletchley. And these are the ones that are most commonly asked for. And one is identity. Uh, so that is uh, identity and key management. We kind of pair together because they're very similar. So we have a in Azure, we have something called Azure Active Directory. Uh, we have a, uh, over 800 million uh, unique identities uh, within uh, Azure Active Directory. It's the standard for enterprises um, to use Active Directories. And it does federation. It has a lot of things out of the box for you, multi-factor authentication and things like that. So we're going to be providing that as a um, as a library, as a service uh, for distributed ledger. So it'll be a part of the cripplet fabric and key management as well. So issuing keys, uh, managing the life cycle of keys, like key expiration, key renewal. Um, those types of things are pretty hard to do. Um, we've got a lot of experience in doing that. And you tie that with Active Directory and you start to have the ability to uh, provision keys based on someone's identity. Um, and start to provision things remotely. So you can have nodes join a consortium blockchain. As long as you have the right credentials, you can you know, uh, have a node join a particular blockchain. And the certificates for that node to participate in that will be delivered through that same infrastructure. So we're actually standing on the shoulders of giants here. That's stuff that's evolved over 25 years. Uh, so Azure Active Directory is a piece of that. The other piece is the key management, something called Key Vault which is our globally distributed HSMs. Um, the other one is um, around cryptographic services. So we'll have libraries out there available to you if you want to use homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs, um, all sorts of things will be sort of libraries that are available there, uh, as well as uh, a more distributed application patterns. So we call those gateway services. So things like the BTC relay for Ethereum to Bitcoin, that can be put in that gateway. Uh, you can write your own uh, um, multi-blockchain uh, integration pieces, but it has a distributed transaction coordinator and it has a uh, distributed ledger resource transaction compensation. So if you've ever seen how resource transaction happens and compensation on a relational database, it can roll transactions back. We can't do that on a blockchain. So we have to post uh, corrective transactions. So it's a modified version of that. But those enterprise development patterns uh, for um, complex transactions are being exposed there. And those, again, are things that evolved through products like BizTalk um, and to allow your blockchain systems to work with the rest of the enterprise, whether you have an enterprise service bus or um, you know any type of product, to plug it in and make it a first-class citizen on those networks. Okay, cool. Well, Marley, we're at the end of our episode, so, but thanks so much for coming on and sharing a bit about Microsoft's vision when it comes to blockchain and, and the work you guys have been doing with Bletchley. Thanks. Yeah, I think it will be very interesting to see, you know, not just uh, how this plays out once enterprises really utilize some of these tools that you guys are building, that others are building, and then we're really going to see how that transforms the nature of organizations and how they work into fabric of, of business processes uh, down, the, down the line. I think that would be very interesting to see. So yeah, with that, we're at the end of our episode. We are Epicenter as part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, and of course, uh, we, if you want to help the show, then please leave us an iTunes review. It uh, helps new people uh, find the show. So thanks so much for, for those who do that. And uh, yeah, with that, we're at the end and we look forward to being back next week.